Right, hello and welcome to another expert interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined again by Patrick Renoise. How are you doing, Patrick? Very good, thank you. How are you? Excellent. And Patrick's new book has just come out, hit, uh, hit the bookshelves, Amazon, everywhere. The Persuasion Code, how neuromarketing can help you persuade anyone, anytime, anywhere. Anywhere, anytime. Um, and Patrick, uh, you wrote your first book 16 years ago. And as we were saying just before we came on air, you've been kind of writing, you and your co-author have been kind of writing this book now, follow-up book for 16 years. So well, how has it taken so long? <laughs> well, it's taken so long because the very first book that we wrote was actually the first book on neuromarketing. So, you know, most people didn't even know what neuromarketing was. Uh, we did not invent the word. We adopted it, you know, the first time we heard it because we felt... It was the best explanation of what we were doing. But just, you know, the amount of things that have come out that have been new in the last 16 years uh, made it overwhelming. And we felt we had to write really a second book about it. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the major things that have evolved or changed uh, or that you've discovered in, in the interim that uh, really made this, made this uh, new book compelling? Well, a number of things. But the first thing is when no marketing first started to appear, the promise was just almost too good to be true. In other words, people have known for a long time that marketing does not really work mm -hmm. you know, because marketing is about asking people, what do you want? And then you base your product development and your sales and marketing strategy on what people have self-reported. So right. because we know people don't know what they want, uh, you know, billions of dollars are wasted on failing marketing campaigns every year. So the promise of neural marketing was that by measuring directly on the body of people, various physiological changes, that would, we would get a really good indication about what they really want. And as a result, you know, everybody would save money, all marketing campaigns would be way more uh, effective, etc. But it has not really been uh, delivering on its promise. And one of the reasons is that it's very easy to gather data. In other words, you can put electrodes on the head of people, you can ask them questions, you can make these physiological measurements, but how do you interpret those and how do you actually deliver marketing insights that generate results? This is more complicated than what people originally thought. And it took us oh, you know, about 15 years to realize that without an interpretation model, people do not really see the benefits of normal marketing. And that's the subject of our second book. We say, yes, normal marketing is great. We can measure all these things, but do not expect to get miracle results especially if you're not using a predictive model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our second book addresses this issue and it also gives a complete scientific picture of the model that we first published 16 years ago. So, so now we go at a much finer level of detail about justifying, for example, you know, I'll just give you one example among mm -hmm. many, that you know, why do stories work when you're in sales? Why, do picture, why are pictures more effective than text? So we give simple yet scientific explanation about all the things that a lot of people were doing intuitively in the past, but they didn't know why they were working. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. Maybe outline a little bit more about the, the model and, and how you can actually start to measure and interpret these things. Sure. So first of all, our model is based on the work of Daniel Kahneman, who was the winner of the Economy Nobel Prize in 2002. Uh, more recently, in 2017, one of his students guy by the name of Richard Teller also won the Economy Nobel Prize and he went mm -hmm. further in this. So we've based our model on the work of these people. And here is the fundamental discoveries that they've made, which is that we have two personalities, if you want. In other words, in other words everybody has multiple personality mm -hmm. disorder. <laughs> and there is the rational us and there is the primal us. Mm -hmm. Kahneman called it system one for the primal us. It's the unconscious brain. It's the brain that helps you um, you know, deal with digestion, breathing, low-level bodily function. And then on top of that, you have a much more evolved brain called the uh, rational brain, and he called that system too. And although we think that we make decisions using our smart brain, in reality, the impact of our primal brain on the rational brain is greater than the impact of the rational brain on the primal brain. Mm -hmm. So what we have done is we have studied, again, you know, for about 20 years now, the working principles of that primal brain. And because that primal brain, by definition, is ancient, you know, we share that brain with very primitive forms of life, like uh, reptiles. Right. Because that brain is so ancient, and the internet did not exist back then, that brain can only be triggered by one of six stimuli. 
So we teach people how this stimuli works. And our expertise is in translating those six stimuli into what people should do in sales and marketing. And further than the stimuli, we have translated those stimuli into four steps that everybody should master. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you. So, so what you're what you're saying is so as you said. I mean, we believe because we all believe that we're very highly sophisticated people. That right. you know all the decisions we make, you know, we rationalize them and all of that kind of stuff. But what you're saying is, um, there's a it's a lot more primal how we do it. Maybe our our physio how we physiologically react to things. I mean, that actually is a much bigger driver of our decision making process. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, uh, Antonio Damasio is one of, the, one of the world experts on the role of emotion of the brain. He said, we are not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think. So all of the emotions, you know, they win over all the rational aspect of our decision making. Mm -hmm. And even further than the emotion, the issue of survival is key to all the decisions we make. The only thing is we're not even aware of it. But you know, take price, for example, right? I mean, everybody right now is happy to pay $5 and get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. That in itself is pretty high, right? Yeah. However, if Starbucks was going to put the price of coffee at $20, people would start to hesitate to buy a cup of coffee there, right? Why? Because they know that if they spend too much money on their cup of coffee, they might not have enough money to pay their rent, which down the road is the modern version of survival, mm -hmm. right? So again, all, this ha all these phenomenons happen at the level of our unconscious, but they have biological manifestation, which are undeniable. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you look at even the most primitive forms of life, primitive forms of life respond with the fight or flight syndrome or the approach or withdrawal syndrome. Mm -hmm. right? In other words, the first form of life is a unicellular. And if you take a unicellular here and you put a drop of sugar close to it, that unicellular will be drawn to the sugar because it's a source of energy. So that unicellular will do everything it can to move closer to that stimulus of the sugar. Now take the same unicellular and drop a drop of acid close to it or you know, lemon juice, and that unicellular will move away. Well, we human beings still operate the same way. In other words, if you put in front of my nose a very desirable item like the, you know, the latest iPhone or the latest Netflix subscription or whatever, my natural tendency will be, I will be drawn towards it. And of course, it's the job of Apple, if I buy the iPhone, to create that positive emotion that draws me towards it. Mm -hmm. But those stimulus that are created by companies that are trying to sell you something, fundamentally, they operate at the same level as the phenomenon that happens in the unicellular. It's all about the biology of the equation. Yeah, it's very interesting because I was just thinking because when I was having this conversation with somebody the other day and it always fascinates me, one of the biggest purchases people make in their lives is a home, right? And yet, think of the buying process for most people. You go around, you look at a few houses and then you decide one because you get a feeling from it. And you maybe only spend like 20 minutes in the place and next minute you're already you're putting in bids and everything. And and you spend more time, as you say, probably deciding, will I get the iPhone S or X or whatever? Or the, the and you, know, <laughs> you said something very interesting. You said you have the feeling that something's happening. But for most people, guess what? They don't even experience that feeling. In other words, that feeling stays below the level of consciousness. And at the end of the day, they might decide that they like this house. Because that house had the exact same smell that the cookies that their grandmother cooked yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, which is and why again, it's a good tip for people is to always bake cookies before people come to look at your house. It's a yes, tip. and they make sure the house is warm and they make sure you know that the light is on. They make sure that the house is staged, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you're absolutely right. Here sure is what happens. And Damasio said that. He said, we make emotional decisions and then we rationalize them. Right. But not vice versa. Yeah. And again, I, I know it would take me a, a little longer than this discussion, but we have all the scientific proofs of that. This is undeniable. So, what is it that most? Uh, what would your be your advice? Obviously, I, you know, get the book and read it. But what would be your advice to people who are looking at their marketing today? How can they tell whether they are? Um, Movie, whether they're able to do what you're describing here or whether they're completely missing the mark and they're well, not I, I, again, 
Yeah, I can give you tons of examples, but so this, the six stimuli are very precise in our presentation. I mean, one of the stimuli is the concept of visual. Again, this is nothing new because we all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. But the you know the brain is mostly visual. People say that about eighty percent of all brain activity is about processing images. Uh, by the way, if you look at the opposite of visual in terms of conceptual data, it would be text, right? In other words, if I want to tell you about the concept of a cat, I can either show you a cat or I can tell you the word cat. The third way to communicate the concept of cat would be to hand you a cat. Mm -hmm. So people learn in three ways. It's called visual, auditory, kinesthetic. We have those three channels for learning. Now, most companies today, when they communicate their value prop, they do it using words. When you go on their website and you see a long explanation about what they do. Well, unfortunately, that primal brain is mostly visual. Um, so what that means, I'm not suggesting that you need a visual of the product, mm -hmm. but you need to come up with a visual that becomes a symbolic representation of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I sell a very, very complicated software solution to a, you know, a large industrial organization, and one part of my value proposition is it will save you money, mm -hmm. then the concept of saving money, how can I represent that? So I may use a picture of a safe. I may use a picture of a banknote. But that's what I mean by this, you know, being able to go the next step. I could say it saves you money. I'm using text. There is no emotion in it. Or I can actually show you a picture of a banknote. Mm -hmm. um, give you another example. If the core of your value proposition is easy, well, I can talk about easy all day long. Or I can show you a picture of the easy button from Staple. Mm -hmm. Or if your value prop is uh, one-stop shopping, I could use the Swiss Army knife. Because the Swiss Army knife, you know, becomes the symbol of the screwdriver, the cork opener, and the, the blade. Yeah. So going one step beyond the simple value prop that uses normally words, using a visual is key. So that's that's one thing. Yeah. Another concept would be, you know, today most people talk about the fact that they are a leading provider of. The problem is all your competitors are saying the same <laughs> thing. So that does not trigger that primal brain because one of the stimulus is contrast. You know, the primal brains need contrast, you need to see that all the other guys do this, but you're the only one who do that. Now, of course, it's easy to say, but if you have a commodity, how do you create that uniqueness? And we demonstrate to people that they have to scratch their head. They have to find that uniqueness at all costs to increase the amount of contrast so that your customers see all the other solution as the green apple. And then suddenly you become the only red apple. Right. And that only red apple is what triggers the decision of people. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, as you say, I mean, the you know, the perception, at least in most buyers of that most products and services are highly commoditized today. Right. And that they're easily you can easily swap from one to the other. And it's no big, big deal. So. I see where you're uh, today more than ever that concept of finding something that stands out for you is absolutely critical. And what you're saying there is it's the only way you're going to elevate yourself or catch anyone's attention. Otherwise, you're going to stay in the in the swappable. Group. Well, I imagine you're selling water eh? mm -hmm. and you have two competitors that are selling similar water. Then your probability to win the deal is only going to be one third. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go beyond that simple probability, you've got to find a way to say what's different about your water. Mm -hmm. And most people, again, when they are in the commodity business, most people shy away from doing it because they are looking for the differentiation in the product itself. And you won't find it because by definition, it's a commodity. Mm -hmm. So you've got to find a way to say that you will deliver the water for free or you will do, you know, your packaging is recyclable or you're the greenest provider of uh, you know, water or whatever. And amazingly enough, regardless of if that differentiation of that uniqueness does not belong to the product, it will still create enough appeal in the brain of the customer that they might decide to buy from you. So, so one of the things you say in 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 the in in the uh, material surrounding your book is obviously when somebody approaches this first and goes neuromarketing, ooh, that sounds very complex. I don't know if I could do that. But you're saying that it actually you have been able to make this simple where people can actually understand how to do it and actually deliver it. 
Yeah, in fact, I think we made a big mistake. When we named our first book Neural Marketing, in fact, the subtitle was Understanding the Buy Button Inside Your Customer's Brain, we assumed that people would understand what neural marketing means. Mm -hmm. So in our second book, we decided that is not the right title. And that's why we named our second book The Persuasion Code. Uh, and it's really about understanding how people use their brain to make buying decisions. And it's really about not only using science, but simplifying that science. Mm -hmm. You know, Kahneman, the guy who won the Economy Nobel Prize I just mentioned, was a very, very sharp fellow. The only problem is he didn't make his knowledge very accessible. In other words, okay. his book is PhD++ level reading. And I had to read his book, of course, many times. And most people that have opened up his book, they gave up after 30% of the book just right. because it's so complicated. So a big part of our job in connecting that, in making that connection between the world of neuro, you know, researchers on the brain, and the world of marketing was to simplify the equation. In fact, what we found was the most difficult in that simplification was to make it visual. Mm. In other words, if you look at our book, we have one poster at the beginning of the book, which summarizes everything. And for us to be able to come up with the right visual metaphor to explain what we do, it took us a long, long time. You know, it's a little bit like the teachers that we had at school, right? Mm -hmm. You could have a very, very smart teacher. If he cannot make his knowledge accessible, everybody hates him and nobody yeah, is good yeah. in, his, in his subject, right? And the teacher that could make their knowledge more accessible, regardless of the complexity of the concept that they were teaching, they are the ones that are really helpful. Yeah, yeah, no, because I, I remember one teacher from when I was very, very small, and uh, he used to draw little stupid little pictures in chalk on the on the board, you know, and illustrate everything with these ridiculous little stick figures and doing stupid things. Everybody remembered, everybody knew what he was talking about. And you know why? Because at that moment, it is more appealing for the primal brain of the audience than the neocortex, than the rational brain. In fact, I don't know if your uh, listeners can see the camera, but... Yep. This is our old poster. Mm -hmm. So in our old poster, you know, we had a start point and we had an end point. And that end point was the buy button or the right. I am convinced button, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in our second book now, we've rendered the whole thing a little bit more sophisticated uh, and we're using a completely different metaphor. In fact, it, it's a more scientific metaphor that we're using. Excellent. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, Patrick, is there anything else you'd like to highlight about the book? Well, I just maybe uh, relate the book to what's happening today in the news. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, a lot of people are concerned about what Russia and China are doing. And, uh, you know, our book is releasing the exact date of the book release is September 19th. Mm -hmm. And we'll receive an order from China, from a Chinese publisher. We already bought 5,000 copies of the book. Wow. And the second country that bought our book was Russia. Wow. So uh, on one hand, I'm very excited because it's good for us. On the other hand, I am very concerned because... It's probably the last people that would wish they would know about that science of persuasion. <laughs> Not that they're already really good, but I, I am worried about what they might do with that knowledge. Well, I think the only way to uh, to counteract that is for lots of people in Europe and America to buy it too. <laughs> well, this is the key. I mean, you know, when when you understand how marketeers are trying to influence your decision, mm -hmm. then you can start to protect yourself. Yes. Uh, you know, against how people influence you. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, as a professional in that field, I am always questioning myself. When I want to buy something, I'm going, okay, am I buying it because the message was very good or am I buying it because it's really going to help my life? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can say, no, I don't want it because I don't need it. Sometimes when the message is that good, well, I still buy that ice cream, although I really know it's bad for me. Yes. <laughs> well, everybody needs a little bit of ice cream now and again. Well, listen, uh, Patrick, again, the book is The Persuasion Code, How Neuromarketing Can Help You Persuade Anyone, Anywhere, Anytime, available on all online booksellers. Um, it'll be in the um, Sales Pop bookstore as well. And the release date is, as you said, September 18th, I think. Yes, Excellent. So uh, I really uh, encourage you to go out. And if you get a chance to listen to Patrick speak, he's an excellent speaker, too. So thank you very much for, for joining us today, Patrick. Thank you. And you have a very good day. Yeah, thank you. This is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again for an expert interview really soon. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.